Okay. So hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Bell, and I'm a bioethicist and clinician investigator at the University Health Network, where I primor primarily support the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. This lecture is being co-presented by UHN Bioethics and the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics. On behalf of the whole team, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you today. This lecture is being recorded and archived and can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics website, or if you are a UHN employee, through our UHN Bioethics intranet. The structure of our time together will be as follows. First, we will hear Mrs. Harris's remembrance of her daughter Pippa and her irrepressible nature, and as well her reflections on today's topic. This will be followed by Dr. Marin's presentation, after which we will have a facilitated discussion period moderated by our UHN bioethics colleague, Kevin Rodriguez. We would like to begin by acknowledging the sacred land upon which UHN operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this territory. We also stand in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism and systemic dis discrimination and endeavor to work with our UHN colleagues and leaders to support efforts to advance equity, diversity and inclusion. We thank Bill and Pat Harris and their family and friends, many of whom are attending virtually today. They have made the Philippa Harris Lecture on Bioethical Issues in Cancer Care a much anticipated annual event. The lectureship was established at Princess Margaret by Bill and Pat Harris to honor their daughter Pippa, who in 1981 died at the age of 20 of cancer. This endowed lectureship has been contributing to our community for 39 years. And today, our lecture in Pippa's memory shares the date of remembrance of our Canadian veterans and Veterans Day south of the border where our speaker resides. We have much to remember today. One of the aims of the lecture, in addition to memorializing a remarkable young woman, is to serve as a catalyst for open and respectful dialogue with our community about timely and important facets of ethics and healthcare. This includes topics arising in the context of clinical, organizational and research ethics. Today, our topic could not be more timely and relevant, and it has implications for all of these areas of healthcare ethics. Our various communities have had an unprecedented and often grueling year, and we recognize the tremendous job that our healthcare workers and others have done to care for us. Our accomplished speaker today provides an informed and thoughtful perspective on the ethical challenges that we face in the ongoing effort to deliver cancer care during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will now play a video that Mrs. Harris pre-recorded with the assistance of her daughter, Pippa's sister, Diana. Hello everyone, I am Pat Harris, Pippa Harris's mother. This year, we are participating in the 39th annual Philippa Harris Lecture from Princess Margaret Hospital, and the first virtual one. Many thanks to Anne Heasters and Jennifer Bell of the Bioethics Department for making this possible. The coronavirus pandemic is affecting us all. As a family, we thank all frontline medical workers who risked their own health working face to face with COVID-19 patients. We can understand that cancer patients feel additional concerns for their treatment and safety. Their doctors too have to choose which cancer patients will benefit the most from the available medical resources. This is a very stressful year for many. Pippa had a sense of humor 
and she loved to draw. At our farm, we had a large flock of Dorset sheep. Each year, the sheep have to be shorn. So this is Pippa's take. Here is a group of very fluffy sheep lined up waiting for their turn at the shearers, but they're laughing and hooting to the embarrassment of this sheep who has just come from the shearers and is naked. Here is the fleece. But look at how this sheep give, is giving us a knowing wink because she's wearing a lovely warm woolly scarf and each foot has a warm mitten. Pippa's amusing drawings are a great legacy about her character and how she coped with her trying times. Today, the huge scale of coronavirus has affected the medical support system for cancer patients. Dr. John Maron will discuss how best to offer the available medical resources to meet patient needs. Thank you for speaking today, Dr. Marin. Thank you, Pat. These are very powerful reflections. It now brings me great pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker this year. Dr. Jonathan Marin is a pediatric oncologist, bioethicist, educator, and health services researcher. He cares for children with cancer at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital and serves as a clinical ethicist at each of those institutions. He also is a member of the core teaching faculty at the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Dr. Marin completed his medical training at UCLA, followed by his pediatrics residency at Stanford University. He has completed fellowships in clinical medical ethics at the University of Chicago's McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, pediatric hematology oncology at Dana-Farber Boston Children's, and pediatric health services research at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Were that not enough, he also received a master's degree in public health with a focus on clinical effectiveness from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. His work has been published in numerous highly regarded journals, including JAMA Pediatrics, the American Journal of Bioethics, Pediatrics, Cancer, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, JAMA Oncology, Blood, and the Journal of Oncology Practice. Dr. Marin's empirical research examines the intersection of ethics and decision-making with a particular focus on ethical issues in cancer genomics and other advanced technologies. Among various leadership positions, Dr. Marin is the current chair of the Ethics Committee of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. At Harvard Center for Bioethics, he co-directs the Master's in Bioethics course, Introduction to Clinical Ethics, and directs Pediatric Bioethics, along with several courses in the Medical Student Ethics curriculum. Germane to today's topic, Dr. Marin has been involved locally and nationally in examining ethics and policy related to COVID-19 and its impact on patient care during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would now like to welcome Dr. Marin to present. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bell. Let me uh, get my screen shared up here. How are we looking there? Looks good. Okay. Um, so today, um, as Professor Bell mentioned, um, I'll be speaking about ethical issues in cancer care raised during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, before I begin, I just really want to express how honored I am, really more than I can possibly express uh, to give this year's annual Philippa Harris Lecture on Bioethical Issues in Cancer Care. Um, I do want to thank uh, Professor Bell, Professor Hestra, UHN, Princess Margaret Cancer Center, the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics, uh, and everyone else involved in putting this together um, for inviting me and to all of you for attending, uh, virtually at least. <laughs> Um, I only wish that I could be giving this talk in person in order to meet, to meet and, uh, all of you who I haven't met and to catch up with all of some of you who I have. 
Um, but also just because T Toronto truly is one of my favorite cities in the world. And any chance I have to come to Toronto, I jump at the opportunity. Um, I'd also really like to send my most gracious thanks uh, to the Harris family. It's a true honor to give a lecture named after and in honor of Pippa. As a pediatric oncologist, I certainly have a soft spot for children and young adults with cancer uh, and for their families who are some of the strongest, most incredible people I've ever met. Uh, as uh, Professor Bell mentioned, my clinical research uh, examines pediatric cancer genomics, specifically how we communicate results to patients and families and how in turn uh, they understand and use that complex but really exciting information. Though I obviously can't say how today's technologies would have impacted uh, Philippa's care, I'm optimistic that the work that we're engaging in today is taking important steps forward to help children and young adults with cancer, just like Pippa. Uh, this amazing drawing uh, that uh, the UHN staff shared with me that uh, Pippa made uh, really strikes a chord with me that I think was fantastic, so I wanted to make sure to share it. Um, I was just on service this past weekend, and most of the patient's rooms that I entered looked just about exactly like this, um, though now most of the stuffed animals have little mini masks on them. Um, so all of this is really a long-winded way of saying thank you to all of you, uh, to Pippa and to the Harris family. It's an absolute honor to be joining you today. And with that, let's begin. Um, so here, uh, this, is, this is me, this is us. Um, before I begin, a couple of disclosures. Um, I do serve as a paid member of the Ethics Advisory Board for Partner Therapeutics. I will actually mention a little bit about that a little bit later in the talk. Um, I received payment for giving a talk uh, on emerging bioethical topics in oncology to Sanofi Genzyme. Um, and I do receive uh, research support uh, for my empirical work from ASCO Conquer Cancer, uh, the National Cancer Institute, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, and Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. And a few non-financial disclosures, important that's to recognize who I am and where I'm coming from, because that certainly informs what I have to say. I'm a pediatric oncologist, a bioethicist and health services researcher. So that's the, the frame through which I look at many of these issues. Um, the work that I do in many cases looks at the intersection of ethics and decision-making, particularly relating to cancer genomics and medical uncertainty. Uh, and these, uh, this intersection uh, is, I think, a really important one as we think about uh, some of the ethical issues related to cancer care during the COVID pandemic. I'm, in, I'm particularly interested in the role of communication, which will certainly come back quite a bit throughout uh, the talk today. Um, and I'm from the US, so <laughs> that whether that is a, a limitation to what I'm gonna have to say here or not, I'll, I'll leave to you. Um, but certainly some of the questions that are being raised are, are from a, uh, the US perspective, uh, though I know that we've been all dealing with the same kind of issues, uh, ethical and otherwise, uh, throughout the world. Um, and one last disclosure for all those who are tuning in because they're expecting to have the answers to all of these, um, this probably isn't gonna be that talk. Um, I will be raising more questions then I will be providing answers. Uh, but hopefully uh, I will be providing some tools for us all together uh, to be thinking about these challenging issues uh, and proceeding in an ethically informed fashion. With that in mind, uh, this is a little bit of a, of, of a path of where I hope to take us today. So one, hope to introduce some ethical issues in the COVID-19 pandemic, then specify specific ethical issues in cancer care during the pandemic. Uh, and then I'll highlight a couple of these specific issues. So one, that of resource allocation, two, that of healthcare disparities. I'll propose a potential way forward, uh, and then I'll wanna make sure that we have a healthy amount of time for discussion and question and answer. So I always like to begin a talk with telling you where I'm hoping to take you. So a few take home points that I hope that we'll all come away with uh, at the end of this. So one, COVID-19 has unquestionably transformed either temporarily or permanently many aspects of healthcare, both in oncology and more generally. Uh, two, new, worse, and more complex ethical challenges in the delivery of care uh, to patients with cancer are being seen uh, during the pandemic. Some of these include conflicting duties, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that in just a few moments. 
scarcity of healthcare resources requiring us to use the, uh, the horrible word of rationing. Uh, and disparities in access and outcomes, more so perhaps than we've ever seen before. And finally, uh, perhaps the need more so than ever for clear, compassionate communication, both from clinicians to patients and families, but also from clinicians to clinicians and other members of our staff. So with that, let's dive in. So a few questions to start us off. One, is healthcare different? during the pandemic? It seems like an obvious question, but I think it's important for us to think about it. Two, are the ethical issues faced by patients and clinicians different during the pandemic? If we think about, if we say that the ethical issues are the same, perhaps we can apply the same framework. If there are new, new, new challenges, if there are different challenges, we have to think about how we might change or completely throw out the way we've done things in the past. And finally, if these are different, how do we proceed? An interesting thing about uh, the pandemic is that COVID has brought ethical issues to the public consciousness and to the front pages of the news, perhaps more so than ever. Uh, here are some of the well-known newspapers here in the US that have um, just about every day had something related to ethical issues in COVID on the front pages, whether it's talking about rationing treatment, um, about the inability to be present at the bedside, about differences in end of life care, about immunity passports, about vaccines, about challenge trials for vaccines. Really every day there's been a new ethically complex issue, whether we've identified that as being an explicitly ethical issue. Uh, but these have been dis discussed uh, on the front pages and here we see these clearly just to be sure that it's not just a US issue here on the front pages of some of uh, the Canadian papers, uh, challenge trials, uh, thinking about triage and disability ethics, uh, some of the really challenging and ethically complex questions that we're being faced with. And this has certainly played, played as well in the medical literature and the ethics literature as well. Um, never before have the editorials and perspective pieces in journals like New, the New England Journal and JAMA had as much of a focus on ethics uh, as they have over these past nine months. Uh, and it will be interesting to see how long that will persist even in the post COVID world. So long story short, we could have this talk last for days. Um, we, the, some of the issues that uh, have come up during the pandemic uh, include th that of such a resource allocation of the moral distress of clinicians, of staff, and of families, of balancing conflict and conflicting duties, of delayed diagnosis and delayed treatment, which is something certainly of uh, relevance in the oncology setting, the challenges related to limited visitation of uh, very sick or even dying patients in the hospital because of infectious concerns, the prospect of unilateral decision making that of drug shortages. The issues related to disparities in access and outcomes that we've always seen in healthcare, uh, but have really shown um, been particularly relevant and particularly notable during the COVID pandemic. Uh, at least in the United States, unfortunately, we've seen a great amount of questions related to political interference in healthcare and conflict of interest related to various aspects of the delivery of care. Variability in care, whether it's within an institution, across institutions, or between patients and uh, neighboring beds. Uh, we've discussed crisis standards and how we might think about differential uh, ways we deliver care in the setting of a, health, a public health emergency. Uh, the balancing act between the health of the public and providing optimal care for the patient in front of us. And finally, and unfortunately, thinking about misinformation and mistrust, uh, which is a common battle and a common challenge in medicine, uh, but certainly something that we've seen perhaps more so than ever uh, during the pandemic. I'm going to focus on two of these particular issues here, and I'll come back to these in just a moment, resource allocation uh, and healthcare disparities. So thinking about these ethical issues, um, I think a couple primary points come to mind. So one, care for patients, both those with, that have COVID and those who do not, have been, has been affected deeply by the pandemic. 
and not just patients, but clinicians and healthcare staff. Everybody from the CEO of the hospital uh, to the individuals working in the cafeteria uh, and taking out the trash. By COVID itself, with uh, some people being infected by COVID or having loved ones affected, um, by the necessary alterations in care for patients and how we do our jobs and everything in between. And as I just mentioned, ethics is on the front pages and part of the global conversation more than ever before. If we had conversations at the water cooler, ethics would be a huge part of those conversations, but now we're just having them virtually in other ways. So let's hone in now on how these ethical issues are playing out in the, in the, in the delivery of cancer care. So again, a few questions to have us think about as we start things off. So one, is cancer care specifically different than other types or aspects of healthcare? You could argue that cancer is just one of the many diseases that patients have, but there's cancer has always been kind of put in its own box. And so perhaps cancer care in the COVID pandemic might also be considered slightly differently. And then similarly, are patients with cancer different than other patients? Might we consider a patient who has uh, a new diagnosis of cancer different than one who has heart disease or kidney disease um, or stroke. And then how does this affect the care, whether you consider these to be differences or not, um, the, provide that we, the care that we provide under these uncertain and less than ideal circumstances? So over the past few months, I've been asked uh, to speak with a number of groups about kind of these, some of these ethical issues. Um, a few months ago uh, at Boston Children's, uh, I was giving a ethics round session. That's um, a series that I do lead with doctors and nurses in our pediatric hematology oncology division, exploring some of the ethical issues that we're facing uh, in, in, the, in the clinic and in the hospital. Um, I asked them to help me create a word cloud of what some of the ethical issues related to cancer care that they were seeing during the pandemic. Uh, and this is what you, and what you see here is what, uh, what we created together. Um, so for, I imagine many people are uh, familiar with a lot of these issues and probably would agree with them. So related issues related to consent, to communication, to scarcity, to fear, to justice, questions about age, about racism, the possibility of discrimination, do not resuscitate orders, fear, so lots of emotions, questions about autonomy, resources, shortages, difference in telehealth. The following month is past August. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, as part of the ASCO's virtual annual meeting, uh, we had a town hall uh, about ethical issues in oncology raised during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we did there is walk through uh, a fictional case, but based on a several real cases addressing some of these challenging issues related to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, touching upon these resource allocation questions, operationalization, operational issues, moral distress, uh, and others. And so here's the list again that I showed a few moments ago, but the question is, do these ethical challenges differ in oncology? Um, and over the remainder of my time with you, I'll that we'll dive into some of these, uh, some in detail and some a little bit more superficially, at least examining them individually. Uh, but I'll leave the question up in the air really as to whether the, how different this truly is in oncology versus other areas of medicine. So let's first think about the question of resource allocation. Since this has been something that's really been at the forefront uh, during COVID perhaps more so than any time that most of us can remember. Um, so importantly, public health emergencies result in resource scarcity, which ultimately results in ethical challenges. Resource scarcity is a, is a fact of health, uh, is a fact of health care, uh, but public health emergencies, such as the COVID pandemic, make this uh, more significant than ever before. So the, this is related to two issues. Uh, one decreased supply, and then also increased demand in the combination of those. And so in the set and during COVID, this has most uh, been discussed with regard to ICU beds, to ventilators, but also drug products, blood products, supplies, clinicians and staff. We're now thinking about it with regard to COVID-related therapeutics, 
Uh, and we hope that we will have to think about this with regard to vaccines, assuming that the vaccines currently being studied prove to be both safe and efficacious. In the setting of shortage in a public health emergency, there's a unique requirement to shift the way we think about things. So under normal circumstances, outside of a public health emergency, our primary purpose is optimizing care for the patient in front of us. But under the setting of a public health emergency, we have to, we're, our goal is to maximize benefit for the greater good. So saving the most lives um, or um, doing the, the best for the most, um, various ways of putting the same thing. And embedded within this are a variety of ethical challenges. Um, so there's a huge amount of decisional uncertainty. Uh, we're faced with significant moral distress, interpersonal and intrapersonal conflict, all of these challenges related to doing things differently than we typically do and being faced with trying to do what, what's right, understanding that we may not be able to do so for every patient that comes across our desk. So again, what are some of the questions that we're faced with in this setting? So ultimately, this comes down to these. Who should get scarce resources and who should not? And how does a diagnosis of cancer play into this? Does or should a diagnosis of cancer give an individual greater access to scarce resources, whether it's an ICU bed, a ventilator, an individual therapeutic, whether it's for COVID or for cancer, for instance, a radiation suite? Or perhaps should it give them less access, whether it's related to simply saying they have cancer because they have a prognosis that is not as optimal as a perfectly healthy individual or some other metric. How can or how should we balance care of individual patients with those related to resource stewardship? I'll delve into this particular question in a moment, um, but importantly, it's, it, we, we must recognize that resource scarcity requires not always providing everything for everyone. In the US, we have a very kind of, uh, autonomy focused way of providing care in most cases that we're going to focus on doing what the individual patient if one of us wants. Um, and particularly in the setting of, uh, of oncology that we will devote massive amounts of resources to an individual patient. In the setting of resource scarcity, that may not always be the case. So what happens when we can no longer do that? And then what happens when that inability inevitably harms the patient who's in front of us. And finally, how can we prevent, protect ourselves, our friends and families, and our colleagues while still caring for patients? How do we navigate these conflicting duties? Because what is best for our patients might not best be for us and those around us. Um, we have to think about how this informs what we do, particularly when many are vociferously against the public health interventions that are so important in protecting all of us, whether it's masking, so, uh, social physical distancing, uh, et cetera. So early on uh, in the pandemic, uh, colleagues and I, uh, Steve Joffe, Rashma Jagsi, uh, Rebecca Spence, and Faye Lubaki, uh, developed for ASCO recommendations for the oncology community in thinking about resource scarcity and navigating those during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is uh, available in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and I'll dive into a couple of the guidances that we provided here. Um, though admittedly, these were not new or unique. Uh, we really looked to build upon uh, the scaffolding created by many in the past, both uh, their uh, groups in Canada and the United States, the National uh, Academies of Medicine, for instance, um, and, and Ottawa has, has developed many of these as well, thinking about what are the underlying ethical principles that we need to think about when considering resource scarcity in a public health uh, emergency. Uh, we look to how, um, apply these specifically uh, to oncology, uh, to the oncology community and to cancer patients. So a couple of the issues that we hope to think about were how we consider these conflicting duties that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, in these guidelines, we touch upon some of the unique challenges related to resource allocation for patients with cancer during COVID, because many of these do come down to these conflicted duties. So one, this question of our underlying duty to provide care in the best interests of individual patients, so the patient in front of us, whether it's in the hospitalized inpatient bed or in our clinic, uh, 
and how we balance that against the duty to steward resources to maximally benefit the greatest number, you know, with the understanding that doing the absolute best and most for the patient in front of us may not ultimately be doing the best for the greatest number. And similarly, how do we balance the duty of clinicians to patients with the duty of the public to clinicians or that of the institutions to clinicians? When we have been having ongoing shortages of PPE, uh, how, what is the role and the duty of institutions in that setting to be to their clinicians and staff in order to be able to provide the care that we all want to provide to our patients and to the public? And finally, how do we uh, balance the duty of clinicians to patients with the duty of clinicians to one another when we ultimately, inevitably, will be having um, conflicts about what we think is the right thing to do, not only for the patient, but more on a larger level, uh, and that will be distressed by not all being in agreement, as is often the case. And the underlying question around all of this is that whereas under no, typical non-emergency circumstances, we have a degree of autonomy in making decisions about our patients, in the setting of resource scarcity, the oncologist may not always be the one who makes the final decision about their patients. If a patient with widely metastatic and progressive cancer um, is, needs admission to the ICU, um, but there are no, there's a scarcity of ICU beds because of COVID, conceivable that the oncologist will not be able to get their, their patient into the ICU, for instance. So building upon this a little bit more, a few specific questions that we and concepts that we hope to um, discuss here. So one, the importance of consistency. And so this, so this is the idea of treating like patients alike. Importantly, however, this doesn't mean that all patients will or all patients should be treated alike. Um, what do I mean there? Well, it, it could be ethically justifiable in the example that I just mentioned for a patient dying of cancer to not receive access to a scarce resource. Um, if we're considering that somebody needs to, but not everybody can get an ICU bed, a ventilator, the last dose of a given drug um, or transfusion, uh, we have to think of ways to go about divvying up those resources in an ethically and clinically thoughtful way um, but it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to treat everyone, unfortunately, but doing so consistently is important. And that's related to, but not quite the same as being fair. Uh, and so we should treat it like patients alike, but we also want to make sure that these resources are allocated based on ethically relevant differences. This comes down to questions related to equity, equality, and justice that I'll come back to a little bit later because these are close, closely related, but distinct entities. Um, and so one instance and one example important to our world of oncology um, is the idea that a cancer diagnosis alone should not preclude access to these scarce resources. So we need to be thoughtful when we're thinking about how we decide who gets an ICU bed and who does not, who is able to get on a ventilator and who not, who gets that uh, vaccine dose and who doesn't that just because you have a diagnosis of cancer shouldn't preclude you. Just in the same way that just because you had a stroke or you have kidney disease um, or you have a neurological problem, that should not ultimately be the be all end all, um, though it may play into the decision of calculus. Um, as an example on the operational side of some of these ethical conflicts, um, this past spring, um, the oncology program at Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, tried to figure out a way to balance optimizing care for patients, uh, those who might have COVID, those who might be at risk for COVID, uh, and those who do not, um, with protecting clinician staff and other patients. Um, at that point, uh, as I know was the case uh, in many places around the world, testing wasn't as available as it was as it is now, uh, and testing was quite slow. Um, so it's a huge challenge to figure out, okay, how do we get patients in to get the care that they need, uh, but make sure that we're not putting everyone at risk of having huge COVID outbreaks and uh, the morbidity and mortality associated with that. Um, so these, for these resources that were scarce even before COVID, like the radiation suites, uh, which is really where this, uh, this, this plan was being developed for, 
uh, this really became really challenging. Um, and so in this setting, we had multiple institutions sharing communal resources, and there was a huge amount of conflict about how best to proceed uh, during these COVID-related shutdowns. Um, and so a process was developed for what was called, quote, a pragmatic and transparent ethical process. Though, as you can see from this flow diagram, there was very little transparent about it. Um, and you could argue about how pragmatic it truly ended up being, but at least there was a plan. Um, so this plan was and is important. Uh, this was another piece that we uh, described in our ASCO guidelines was the need for thoughtful and anticipatory planning of how to proceed because perhaps the worst thing that we can do in the setting of resource scarcity and during COVID is have these one-off decisions being made at the bedside. Um, this duty, the duty to plan, is a really fundamental consideration here, uh, both in oncology and more generally. Um, but as you can see from uh, the complexity here uh, and probably in your own practice, good plans uh, are easier said than done. Which brings me to a lesson taught to me by one of my early mentors in ethics, uh, that good ethics require good facts. Simply put, we cannot make ethically sound decisions without knowing the factors at play, the stakeholders that are involved, the data, the numbers. So what are the data about COVID in our oncology population? How has COVID affected patients with cancer? Well. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with some of these numbers, but as, uh, as a reminder, um, one study recently demonstrated a 13% mortality rate in adult patients with cancer who've been diagnosed with COVID. Um, this is, a, depending on uh, the data that you're looking at, this is anywhere between uh, three and 10 times mortality rates in adult patients who do not have cancer. Factors that were associated with a greater hazard for death include active cancer, older age, and comorbidities. So not surprising given these are um, similar uh, risk factors outside of oncology. Uh, I happen to appreciate uh, that in this study, uh, residents in cancer was protective against death. So uh, I'll be coming and joining you guys soon if I can. Um, interestingly, active treatment, be it with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiation, or hormonal therapy in this study was uh, not associated with increased risk of mortality. Um, and a couple of different studies have then looked to see, using modeling, what is the effect of COVID and the alterations in care on deaths, finding that an estimated 7 to 10% increase in cancer-related deaths due to diagnostic delays, delays in treatment, and everything in between. Uh, and, and this group uh, published recently uh, in Lancet Oncology uh, estimated that to, to this point, uh, these delays will account for a, about 60,000 years of life, lo life lost in the oncology community. So clearly a huge impact here uh, on everything that's going on. So what does that mean? How do these facts affect the ethics? So importantly, we have to recognize that there's a greater COVID-related mortality in patients with cancer. Um, before this talk, I just found out this morning that one of my pediatric oncology patients has a family member who was just uh, diagnosed with COVID. So now I have to think about how I'm going to integrate that into my decision-making for that patient, uh, their risk, uh, and thinking about then the resources involved uh, and potential outcomes for treatments for them and for others. And then how do we consider cancer when allocating scarce resources? This is a question I'll come back to um, a couple of times throughout the rest of uh, this talk. Do we consider cancer as a poor prognostic indicator? We've been looking to identify over these past six or nine months, what are the features that put an individual at risk for increased COVID related mortality and morbidity? Is, should we consider cancer as one of these? Should we consider cancer as a disability? We consider disabilities to be a protect to be protected entities, and such in that way, perhaps we shouldn't uh, consider cancer in that way, or should we say cancer is just different? We shouldn't can consider cancer in any way with regard to this, it's, and it just shouldn't play into our decision making or into the ethics. In the United States, uh, and I know that there's been a similar process in Canada. Um, we've been 
dealing with the public health emergency of COVID via crisis standards of care. Um, and so early on uh, in the pandemic, either immediately or eventually, uh, all nearly all states declared a state of emergency related to COVID. Uh, this enabled states to have access to additional funding and to change the way we do practice. Uh, this involved revised crisis standards of care, meaning that under these unique circumstances, it was not only acceptable, but, requ but required that we in healthcare and in other situations as well, do things differently. Um, and this was sort of the fundamental piece of how we would allocate resources uh, and, provide, and uh, provide triage during the COVID pandemic. So most of these revised uh, or newly developed crisis standards of care uh, that were both developed at the state and hospital level most of these provided explicit guidelines on how to allocate scarce resources. Uh, some were specific to COVID, some were in a more general public health emergency. Um, and so uh, this spring, uh, Dr. Andrew Hentel uh, and a couple of other colleagues and I at Dana Farber uh, looked at the publicly available crisis standards uh, in the US for patients with cancer, looking at how these considered a cancer diagnosis in our oncology patients. So we found that about two thirds of states in the US at that time uh, had publicly available crisis standards, meaning they were uh, on the internet and readily, readily findable or searchable. Um, interestingly, over half of those 31 had been published or updated since the start of the pandemic. Of, this, of the crisis standards that were available, uh, over half explicitly deprioritized patients with cancer, meaning they were by definition going to have less access uh, to limited resources. Uh, and a quarter categorically excluded patients with cancer, meaning when considering triage um, or allocation framework, such as how do we calculate who should get um, that last ICU bed or that last ventilator, um, one quarter of these states crisis standards of care said, by definition, we will not give that, give access to patients, to some or all patients with cancer. Interestingly, we performed a variety of multivariable analyses to look at predictors for these inclusions and exclusions um, and presence of, an, of a National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. So the kind of most highly regarded level of cancer care in the United States uh, so having uh, an NCI uh, comprehensive cancer center in that state was associated with a lower odds of a cancer related categorical exclusion. These are small numbers, so it, we were hesitant uh, to make large assumptions or connections based on this, but interesting nonetheless. Um, so this is a map of the United States uh, demonstrating some of the uh, features that I just described. Uh, so states, uh, uh, in white, uh, at the time that we did our analysis, did not have a uh, had, had a crisis standard that was available, but did not deprioritize or exclude patients with cancer. Uh, at the time of our analysis, those states in black did not have a crisis standard uh, that was publicly available. Um, these grayed out states both deprioritized and excluded patients in some fashion or another, uh, those who had cancer. And the, uh, the hashed states either had a cancer exclusion or deprioritization in their crisis standard. Uh, and so this, this work uh, is currently in press in GEM Oncology and should be out uh, in another month or so. So clearly, quite lots of questions here, um, but not, not many answers just yet. So some of these questions, how should patients with cancer be considered when allocating scarce resources? Should they pr be prioritized? Should they be deprioritized? Should there perhaps be no impact on their prioritization? Um, there was great debate about how patients uh, with comorbidities should be considered when it was realized that we may not have enough ICU beds or ventilators for everybody who might benefit from them. So how should we consider patients with cancer? This is almost certainly going to be a question that we will be struggling with. Um, throughout our practice uh, and our ethical landscape until the pandemic ends and perhaps even longer. Related to this, do we think of cancer as a disability? Is considering cancer diagnosis in these protocols discriminatory? 
the disability rights community has spoken up uh, vociferously and thoughtfully uh, about the potentially discriminatory nature of the resource allocation frameworks that have been developed and the crisis standards that have looked at saying, okay, if we are dealing with a shortage, how we should decide between patient A and patient B. Many of these, including questions related to uh, prognosis um, or comorbidities, consists um, in the disabilities uh, community has questioned whether this is discriminatory and inappropriately discriminatory against those with disabilities. Do we consider cancer in the same way? And finally, what does this mean for those, for the resources that we do have to allocate a ration? Um, I mentioned before about my role on um, the ethics advisory board for a company, and that's uh, what I'm talking about here that we have to make these allocation decisions for scarce resources for vaccines and potentially for drugs repurposed for COVID. Um, one of, uh, so this, this company that I was invited to help with, uh, they make a drug that is used uh, as part of a larger drug cocktail for cancer. Um, and this drug is now being, is now in clinical trials for COVID related lung disease. And so one of the questions that we were exploring was what should the company do and what should we do as a larger healthcare infrastructure um, and as clinicians individually, if a drug like that which has a known approved indication for a small subset of patients now starts being used either on or off label in COVID, immediately the demand of such a drug would multiply by many times um, such that the supply would no longer be sufficient. What is the obligation or opportunity perhaps, ethically and otherwise, for a pharmaceutical company in that setting? What is it for healthcare institutions, for our hospitals, for individual clinicians, um, for the public? Um, certainly it's possible there's, since there's numerous drugs being repurposed or tested about for their ability to be repurposed for COVID for this question coming back. We saw uh, what happened with regard to hydroxychloroquine, which is certainly um, a lesson for us all. Uh, but even if we do have an effective vaccine, it's very, it's very likely that this will be a question that we're dealing with for some time. All right. So having spoken a little bit about resource allocation, let's dive into a little bit more of the question of disparities. Um, so one of the unfortunate lessons that we've seen uh, in the United States, but uh, I know this also has no, sh been shown, unfortunately, to be true in many areas around the world, is that COVID does not ultimately affect everyone equally. Um, various studies have demonstrated disparate impact of COVID on disenfranchised and minority populations. Presumably, this is not due to underlying biological differences, but rather due to social determinants, to structural racism, and to the other un unfortunate features of the healthcare system that prevent adequate, timely care. Um, in some ways, COVID has shown a light on the inequities that have long existed in our healthcare systems. Uh, and as a result, we've seen the impact of COVID uh, in a disparate fashion. Uh, several studies recently have demonstrated that in the US, non-Hispanic African-American patients have at least a 2.7 odds of admission for COVID. Um, and that there've been a number of studies uh, looking at mortality rates by race and other uh, metrics, demonstrating that the mortality for blacks is between two and six times greater compared to whites. And similarly, uh, for to Latinos and Latinas, one and a half to five times greater than non-Hispanic whites. Similarly, we've seen these uh, disparities as well uh, in cancer related to COVID. Uh, one study, re, uh, so some of this work was, uh, was presented uh, recently at the ESMO Virtual Can Congress, showing that uh, in one analysis, the odds of Hispanic patients and Black patients were three and two times greater of contracting COVID uh, compared to white patients in their oncology population. Uh, and interestingly, as we've transitioned care from in-person to more virtual, uh, there has been a lower rate of telehealth visits uh, for patients of Hispanic background, 
uh, and black patients with cancer compared to white non-Hispanic patients uh, on the order of around two thirds or three quarters. Um, and unfortunately, perhaps even more problematically, uh, this, this study at uh, an institution, um, at a single institution demonstrated 50% greater odds of treatment delay for Hispanic patients compared to white patients. So again, all in our world of oncology, where we like to think that we're doing everything that we can to provide equitable care to all of our patients, uh, COVID has clearly had an impact in, in that, in, in that, and one of the things that we're going to have to think about how to, how best to proceed uh, as the pandemic proceeds. And so, because telehealth has become so fundamental in oncology care during COVID, I think it's important, particularly, to focus on this question. It's important to examine whether telehealth has been available and access equitably, just as uh, other aspects of healthcare. And unfortunately, we've seen that that's perhaps not surprisingly hasn't been the case. So one, we've been seeing lower rates uh, of telehealth visits for uh, Hispanic patients and black patients with cancer compared to white patients with cancer on the order of about two thirds, one half to two thirds. Um, this raises the question of whether this care is one, either not being delivered at all, um, as mentioned on the last slide with the treatment delays, or whether it's being done in person uh, putting those, these patients of minority background at higher risk of infection, uh, when we already know that these, these patients have a higher risk of severe COVID-related morbidity and mortality. So really just building up uh, and building upon these increased risks and causing greater risk. And so this is also seen in the non-oncology world, and it's important uh, to see these disparities, unfortunately, are not only according to race and ethnicity, but also according to income and other socioeconomic metrics. Um, so one study demonstrated that black patients have a 60% adjusted odds of accessing care via telehealth and urgent care uh, compared to white patients. Um, and similarly, insured patients from zip codes with lower income uh, are utilizing telehealth at a significantly decreased rate for elect both elective and non-elective care. Uh, so many have hypothesized that it for years and years down the road, we will be seeing a potentially widening uh, disparity in outcome related to these disparities in access uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I mentioned before the distinction between equality and equity and justice. Uh, many people uh, here have probably seen these images before, but I think the pandemic has really brought to light, maybe more so than ever before, um, these issues related to disparities in access and outcomes of healthcare, both in oncology and also just more generally. Um, we really have to be thoughtful about how we make changes in our clinical practice, um, because we absolutely have to make changes, as we've discussed, in order to provide care to patients during the pandemic. But are, if, are, if we are doing so, are we going to make changes that one, as we see here in equality, will help everyone? But unfortunately, this does not equally ultimately help everyone because it only continues or perhaps even worsens disparities that exist today. So this is what we say when we when, mean when we say equality. Or do we aim to do so equitably? Do we preferentially help those with the worst outcomes to ideally bring everyone to the same point? So this would mean preferentially providing benefits, however we might do so, to those who have the least access or the poor worst outcomes in order to bring everybody to the same level? Or do we take the final tactic of aiming for justice? Do we look to eliminate the barriers to healthcare and health outcomes to ensure that the disparities that we've seen in the past are no longer there. So changing this kind of picket fence to a chain link fence so everybody can see. These are questions that we've been thinking about for a long time. These are not new to COVID, but they're questions that perhaps we've been talking about more during COVID than ever before. Uh, and I can say that I, I and many others hope that these conversations will continue even after the pandemic and we can discuss uh, ways to go about this uh, a little bit more uh, during the question and answer if people are interested. But an important piece here um, is that there's a calculation that goes on here. And some of this comes down to simple math and the math 
can be it can be a problem. So importantly, uh, thinking about the digital divide and telehealth as a uniquely uh, important resource uh, and healthcare healthcare resource during COVID. So we've been increasing use of telehealth during COVID. Uh, we also know that there are pre-existing outcome disparities, both in oncology and more generally, related to race, to age, to income, and other metrics. Unfortunately, we're beginning to see that the patients who have access to telehealth are those who are already in these advantaged, advantaged populations. So those who already had outcome disparities also have a disparity in their access to the way we're optimally providing care during COVID. So this runs the risk of actually when we're trying to increase access to care during the COVID pandemic by things like telehealth of worsening existing disparities. So without taking a specific and directed effort to make telehealth available to those who have pre-existing outcome disparities in access and outcome, we will actually be only furthering the problem. And how we go about that is really challenging, but it's an important thing that I think we all have to think about in our daily, in our daily practice. Um, ASCO over the past couple of months uh, put together a task force called the Road to Recovery Task Force. Uh, the ultimate goal here was to think about, okay, how is we, can we as the oncology community uh, look to learn from the lessons uh, of COVID in clinical care and in research, and how can we integrate some of these lessons into the post-COVID world? Uh, one of the things uh, that we've raised in those discussions was thinking about uh, utilization of telehealth more going forward. It's something, it's been a resource that's been ideally available or theoretically available uh, to us as clinicians uh, and healthcare systems, but really underutilized but if we're going to utilize it more in the COVID world and the post-COVID world, we have to make sure that it's access it's accessible to all so as to not widen these disparities as we're beginning to see during COVID. So given that less than ideal landscape, what can we do or what should we do? So there's been a variety of options that have been proposed. And importantly, I'm going to walk through a couple of these here, um, but I'm not advocating for any of these specifically, um, but simply pointing out that this is some of, the, some of the different things that people have talked about. So one simply, we, need, we can be more aware. Uh, we can address these disparities later, some have said. We just have to treat patients as best as we can now. So if you come with the patients in front of me, whether they're black, they're white, they're green, they're wealthy, they're poor, uh, they have insurance or they don't, I have to do what I can do. Uh, and thinking about the disparities in access and uh, outcomes, we can deal with that down the road once we're out of the pandemic itself. Some have argued that we should provide different treatment plans for different groups uh, in order to mitigate uh, these differences in outcomes. Uh, we can provide a completely different treatment or a completely different plan for treatment to those who have poor outcomes versus those who have better outcomes, whether it's based on access or otherwise. However, many have argued that this treats the disparity as the cause rather than as the result of the problem. And is this the right way to go about this or is this actually perhaps going to continue or even propagate the issue? Some have proposed providing preferential access to scarce resources for the disenfranchised. One way of thinking about this would be putting those who are at the highest risk or who have been historically mistreated by the medical system first in line. Um, if we have a scarce resource, um, saying that in, in the United States, for instance, those who are African American or have uh, poor, uh, who, or who don't have health insurance or are from a, uh, a poor area. Uh, should be offered access before those of majority groups or more enfranchised groups. However, this is not without its own challenges uh, in a variety of ways, one of which, when given the fact that during COVID, it's not always clear what the right thing to do is and whether the scarce resources that we're considering provided are beneficial. Um, so one of the things we're talking about too is access to new treatments, either via uh, enrollment on a clinical trial or those with incomplete data. 
Um, it certainly does not seem optimal to provide uh, improved access or front of the line opportunity um, to these uh, treatments that may or may not be efficacious and may actually prove ultimately prove harmful. Uh, is that what we want to do? Not so clear. And finally, some groups, including uh, the team led by Doug White at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, has provoked, proposed a sort of correction factor, um, a weighted lottery um, as a way because we're seeing these disparate outcomes uh, in COVID-related uh, in, in COVID related mortality and morbidity uh, in the same population who has been historically mistreated both in the United States and elsewhere so that we can think of a way to provide in, improved access to these resources according to socioeconomic factors. The area deprivation index, which is a way of looking on uh, based on census track um, is one such proposal, meaning that we would give uh, a weighted lottery for something like remdesivir uh, when it was thought that that was the magic bullets in treating COVID, for example, um, and that there would be um, a kind of bonus factor given to those with a high area from a, from a high deprivation area deprivation index. Some have, have proposed a similar uh, weighted lottery or weighting system uh, if, when we think about uh, allocation of the vaccine. Uh, assuming it proves to be efficacious because it's expected that at least in the near term, uh, we will have far more, far greater uh, need uh, than supply for such a vaccine. So these are a few different ideas and I don't mean to, throw, to toss those aside, um, but I want to provide a supplement here, a potential way forward in thinking about uh, how we can proceed with these really ethically challenging issues. So we've been talking for uh, the last half hour or so about COVID-19 related ethics, um, but little of what I've said has been revolutionary. Um, most is, is building upon um, or slightly tweaking the way we think about ethical issues and challenges uh, prior to COVID. Uh, Author Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, uh, a French author uh, in uh, the 1800s, uh, is said to have uh, been the first to say this common ad adage that we say quite often, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, though I'm sure it was uh, much more eloquent uh, and beautiful in French than it is in my English. Um, but perhaps we can think about how we just adjust the way we do things rather than kind of reinvent the wheel. COVID clearly has drastically altered how we deliver cancer care, but I've encourage you to think about whether these ethical challenges are entirely new and are they entirely different? Or is it possible that we're seeing just new and amplified versions of these same ethical challenges? And as such, do we need to completely develop new ethical frameworks for examining these and, and dealing with these challenges? Or can we think about these issues uh, in a, through the same lens, uh, but perhaps with a different tint? And so I propose this. Um, attention to language and communication is as valuable as, as a tool as ever when approaching these new ethical challenges in cancer care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Perhaps really honing in on the words we say, how we say it, and ensuring that we provide clear, comp comprehensive, and compassionate communication with patients and families, and also, and perhaps even more importantly, with other clinicians and staff Perhaps this can play a huge role in navigating some of the ethical challenges we're facing during the COVID pandemic. I don't mean to say by any means that this is a magic bullet. This is not the only tool that we have and this will not be the single solution, but it absolutely can be a valuable tool in our ethical tool belt as we deal with these new but not unheard of ethical challenges. So what do I mean? Let me dive in a little bit here. So we know that language is a fundamental and really important aspect of medical care and ethical provision of medical care, but it's also a common misstep in healthcare, particularly both in the, in, uh, the time of COVID and in cancer. This is something that we deal with regularly uh, and is even more uh, in focus today. So we think about jargon when we're talking about COVID, uh, we discuss viral load transmissibility. These are terms that we don't use when we're walking down the street having a conversation with our friends. Uh, but this is some, it's part of the normal vernacular now uh, 
but it's not clear that when we talk about these kind of things, whether it's the talking heads on the news or we're talking to a patient in our clinic, that they have any idea what we mean when we say these things. It's quite likely that many of, oftentimes when we as clinicians use these terms, we don't quite know what they mean when we say it. Similarly, in the world, word, world of cancer, we use jargon even if we don't recognize it being jargon. Actionable targets. Does that always mean what we think it means? Do patients understand what that means when we say it? Frontline therapies, targeted agents. These are things that we say all the time they're not as jargonish as talking about particular cancer pathways, for instance, or pathophysiology. But absolutely, we have we assume often that these are things that patients, families, uh, and, and caregivers understand, when perhaps they do not. Similar, we use both in COVID and, and cancer quite frequently more war metaphors. We talk about who winning or losing the battle. Um, we talk about heroes and cancer. It's common that we talk about patients as being heroes. Uh, and during the pandemic, interestingly, uh, it's often been the healthcare workers, the clinicians, the nurses, uh, the staff in the hospitals who have been depicted as heroes. Uh, we talk about fights. We talk about fr the front line, either frontline therapies or frontline workers. However, it's not clear to me that these war metaphors actually provide benefits uh, and may actually cloud the picture and make communication more complex and challenging, and provide unintended messages and consequences. We use language oftentimes that has that is not totally clear. So similar to these, the concept of these metaphors and jargon, when we talk about someone in COVID being immune or, sh or still shedding disease, or in cancer, when we talk about disease stability or cure, generally when we as clinicians say each of these things, we know what we mean, we know what we intend to communicate. However, that's not to say that that's what's being understood or that's what's being heard or that's what's being received because cure might mean quite something quite different. Disease stability might mean something quite different for me than it does for the patient that I'm talking to. Immunity in the, term, in world, the world of COVID might mean something might quite different to me than it does to a patient or to a, the public. And finally, along similar lines, we have widely variable definitions. There is a huge subjectivity to a lot of the language that we use that we sometimes assume to be objective in nature. So positive outcome, clearly what I might define as a positive outcome could be very different than either my patient, their family, or even another clinician. Quality of life is clearly subjective, but then some smaller, some more, simple but really important issues related to symptoms. When I call something a minor symptom, it's quite conceivable that that might not be perceived the same way by somebody else. Similarly, when I think of as a good life or even a good death. So I think that thinking about being cognizant of the language that we use and being aware of these missteps that we can make both uh, when talking with other clinicians and uh, with patients and families as well is, is more important, is as important to, or if not more so in COVID now as it ever has been. Um, a few months ago, uh, colleagues and I wrote uh, a paper, uh, Waging War on War Metaphors and Cancer in COVID-19, where we focus specifically on these war metaphors that I've mentioned, uh, highlighting really that one of the things that we should not do is use war metaphors as a crutch. Uh, our patent that it is an easy way to discuss these things, but can have widely problematic and unintended consequences as we communicate with patients. Um, so I caution against war metaphors uh, because this is something that we've done often in cancer for a very long time, ever since uh, Nixon first declared war on cancer in the 1960s. Um, but it's been very much a, uh, a, a mixed message and a, uh, with many unintended consequences. So what should we do? What can we do? So a few things that I would recommend. One, be clear. You don't have to be certain to be clear. You can be clear about your uncertainty. Um, ask if patients, if families, if other clinicians that you're working with understand what you're saying and that they, what their understanding is, is, is the same as what your, what your understanding is. Do be transparent. Decisions may not always be in your hands. If there is a 
scarce resource and a triage committee is ultimately deciding if your patient is going to be admitted to the ICU or have access to a ventilator, but you don't get to make that final decision, you should say so. You have the relationship, the best relationship of anybody in the hospital, most likely, of, with, of anybody with your patient who has cancer. And so if the decision is not in your hands, it's okay to say so and explain how that decision will be made, even if it is not the decision you would like to make and it is not the decision that you are making. Do be honest. The answer I don't know is a wonderfully honest answer. We hesitate to say that oftentimes because it confers a sense of vulnerability. But maybe more so now than ever before during the pandemic, we all are vulnerable. And so honesty about that vulnerability uh, is hugely important, uh, both for patients and for everyone else. Do, of course, be compassionate. This is something that we consider to be at the core of oncology practice, and it's as important now as it ever has been. Compassion, being compassionate to our patients, to our colleagues, to our uh, to caregivers, and to every and, and to staff, everyone in between. And do think about unintended consequences. Rarely do our actions only have the intended consequence that we mean. So be cognizant of and look out for unintended consequences, even if we don't expect there to be any. As I mentioned before, this is absolutely not the solution here. This is the, uh, the first step uh, in, a, in a process uh, and certainly a much larger, a small piece of the puzzle. Um, but hopefully optimizing language and communication can be a way forward in dealing with the many ethical challenges that we have, that we face um, for in caring for our patients with cancer during the COVID pandemic. So to remind you of the take-home points that I told you at the outset. So one, unquestionably COVID has transformed many aspects of healthcare, both in oncology and more generally. We're dealing with new, worse, and more complex ethical challenges in the delivery of care to patients with cancer, um, including having conflicting duties, scarce resources, disparities in access and outcomes, and many others. Uh, we're really bring, shedding light on many of these problems that existed even before COVID, perhaps more so now than ever before. But I think thinking about how to build upon the infrastructure that we've had in the past uh, and, to do, and to tweak and think about this in new and thoughtful ways will be really important as we move forward. And one way to do so is that we need, more so than ever, clear, compassionate communication with everybody involved in the delivery of healthcare, patients, families, clinicians, and staff, and everyone in between. Um, so I'm glad that I think we have some time now for discussion, question, and answers. Um, but before that, I do want to say thank you so much again, both for everyone who invited me to give this talk, uh, to the Harris family, to, to Philippa herself, uh, and all of you. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Marin, for such a wonderful and in insightful talk today. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to go through uh, the questions that, that we see at the moment. Um, so the first question comes from our, our director of bioethics, um, Anne Hasters. The question is, uh, she first of all says, thank you, Dr. Marin, for an exceptional talk. Our bioethics team has been struggling to help facilitate priority setting exercises. One of the things you talk about in your ASCO paper is that we need to take into account, uh, oh, sorry, we need to take account of diagnosis and prognosis. Can you say a little about uh, what that might mean in terms of intergenerational justice? And, um, and mentions I'm thinking about Nancy Jecker's work uh, in this regard. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think one of, so this is one of the cha most challenging aspects uh, when we're thinking about resource allocation. Um, and Im importantly, I think it's one of the, as I, as I alluded to earlier, planning ahead so as to have a plan in place when resources do need to be allocated is one of the most important pieces. So the fact that you're trying to do this priority setting before you need to make these decisions uh, is, is important unto itself. But then how to integrate diagnoses, prognoses, uh, and other factors is where it gets really sticky. Uh, many, many have been trying to develop uh, sort of 
calculators to integrate, uh, to provide a point system or various different things. And one of the issues that's been considered uh, is that of age, um, which inevitably can be seen as either one, uh, ageist, or two, looking at a, a, an opportune way to optimize outcomes. Um, as a pediatrician, generally I say that, okay, clearly kids should get priority because kids are great and that's what I do for a living. Um, but I think this is, a, this is an important question here, whether we, because especially as, since we've seen that uh, COVID has a disparate impact on the elderly, um, then if we're then integrating age into these risk calculators as, as, a sep as a separate entity besides prognosis, we're actually double counting and kind of giving people two tick marks uh, if, if, they're, if they're older. Um, or if we're saying we're going to um, put kids at the front of the line, or when we know that children, at least on the population level, are much at much lower risk of, uh, of morbidity and mortality, both related to COVID and more generally, we're dually benefiting them. And so I think that probably age in, in this setting shouldn't be considered as a unique entity, uh, ethically, clinically, or otherwise, when we're, when we're prioritizing scarce resources uh, in COVID. Um, I mean, one, but one way some have thought about this in the past um, was a sort of a total lives uh, way of looking at things that in, instead perhaps of prioritizing in a uniform way, younger over older, that we may give a small prioritization to those who are in the adolescence or young adult period because they have the most, we've already invested societally maximally in their lives um, and they have the most uh, to look to uh, then give to society going forward. Um, but I think it would be very reasonable at the same time to say, we're not going to consider age as a separate entity here. Um, but we have to also be thoughtful about, can we apply these same metrics and these same calculators to all resources? That if it's something related specifically to COVID versus it's a healthcare resource for the institution or health system that's not just related to COVID because that may change the way we think about prognosis um, and prioritization. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Rebecca Shalansky, and she asks, uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the ethics surrounding the increased acceptance of experimental treatments during the COVID era, which is already a mainstay in the cancer treatment world. For example, how hydroxychloroquine turned out to have a negative consequence without benefit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been fascinating to see both from a clinical practice, research practice, research ethics, clinical ethics perspective, how the same issues that we have been thinking about for a very long time have really uh, come to the forefront uh, during COVID. Um, I think, uh, so I mentioned before that good ethics require good facts. Um, and I think this, play, this holds true with this more so than anything else, that um, we have a tendency as clinicians uh, to want to do everything that we can for the patient in front of us, sort of the, the rule of rescue, that we want to save those who need saving. Um, and throwing the kitchen sink at somebody, even at, in an absence of sufficient data, uh, is commonly done. That's sort of, we've done that up for a long time in oncology, um, perhaps more so than just about any other area of medicine. Um, but collection of data and utilization of data um, is been proven to be really important here. Uh, and hydroxychloroquine has been a great example of that, that people very much got on the boat with it saying based on less than ideal data early on. Um, and we probably unfortunately have caused at least some degree of harm to patients by providing care that was not uh, ethically or uh, uh, at least ethically sound or at least sound in terms of the data supporting it. Uh, collection of that data and using those data um, are really important and for using those data to inform patient care. Um, the UK has done a really incredible job of uh, providing these massive clinical trials to truly answer these questions. In the US, we have done a very mediocre job at this. Um, but I think this will be a lesson 
that hopefully we can uh, we can learn and use going forward in the oncology community because the way we apply data or don't apply data regarding the efficacy, uh, safety, and otherwise of our new drugs in oncology is changing. Um, and I think that some of the lessons that we've learned um, about how to optimally perform and organize clinical trials in COVID, I think will be helpful to us in the oncology world going forward as well. Great, thank you. Um, our next couple of questions are actually from Jennifer Bell. And, and with, with her permission, I'm just going to jump ahead because uh, we're lucky we have access uh, to you, Jonathan, uh, at, you know, outside of this. But uh, so my apologies, Jennifer, I'm going to jump uh, and get back to you. Um, but Samuel Dale asks, uh, Dr. Marin, I'm currently working on a project fo focusing on visitor policies during COVID-19 and how overly restrictive or conversely overly liberal policies harm patients psychologically, uh, which can influence treatment outcomes. Have you encountered this dilemma in your pediatric oncolog oncological care during the pandemic? And I'll add actually, because Jennifer's um, question is, is similar. Um, so she says that visitor restrictions are very hard for patients, caregivers and staff. Patients want the support of their caregiver in hospital and staff want to enable this, uh, but we also need uh, to balance this with safety of staff and other patients. So are there any, any tips for patients and staff navigating this challenging and morally distressing issue? So the long story, uh, the, long, the short answer to that long question is yes. So <laughs> that's something we've absolutely been, deal, been dealing with and struggling with to a huge degree, both in pediatrics uh, and in oncology more generally. Um, we, we pride ourselves uh, in oncology of being able to provide thoughtful, compassionate care, whether it's at the end of life or in the setting of severe illness. Um, and much of that involves providing the clinical care, but also the psychosocial support and providing, serving as sort of the liaison between patients and their families to be able to have uh, that support in place physically and otherwise. COVID has really thrown that for a loop. Um, and so as, uh, as those questions alluded to, we've had to make, I mean, early on, especially when we didn't really understand what was going on with COVID and things were really heating up, uh, there were huge visitor restrictions. In the, in the world of pediatrics, we, those restrictions, at least in my own institutions, were a little, le a little bit more lenient, um, having allowing a parent at the bedside, whereas uh, in many of the adult hospitals, uh, no uh, visitors were, were allowed. And so ultimately that led to patients dying alone. Um, I think thinking about ways that we can use technology um, to bring, patient, uh, bring family into the, the clinic or into uh, uh, the ICU or the patient room, whether it's with a tablet or video or something else like that, that's been a helpful adjunct, but certainly not sufficient. I think one other thing that we've struggled with a lot that I, that we'll, that I think is really important to think about is when we have these, when we put these rules in place, when we, when we amend those rules, um, because we always want to provide the optimal care for the patient in front of us. And so if I, for instance, have a patient uh, who's at end of life, I'll, we've, we've seen this numerous times that people say, okay, this clearly, this is a, a unique circumstance. This is, this is different. We shouldn't, we, we should find a way to bend those rules and allow them to have a family member or a couple of family members at the bedside so that this child is not dying alone. However, when we, we have to be thoughtful about how we bend those rules and are we doing so equitably, especially as we're having a greater focus on implicit and unconscious biases. Uh, one of the things that I've been working with uh, at my own institution, for instance, is think about, okay, if though it is completely reasonable and laudable to want to bend these rules to provide the optimal care that we can for the patient in front of us, we need to also be cognizant that when we bend rules, we have the potential to do so in an inequitable and biased fashion. So we need to make sure we're bending the rules equally for everybody. And so collecting data on that and sort of a quality improvement or quality assurance method to ensure that, okay, are we bending the rules for the wealthy patients the same way as we are for the poor patients, for the black patients and the white patients similarly? Is, is, or are we actually perhaps when trying to do the right thing, uh, again, causing more of these disparities in care that we've unfortunately uh, been, uh, been providing 
for a long time. Great, thank you for those insights. Uh, the next question is going to Jennifer Bell. Um, so she says, thank you, Dr. Marin. So you highlight communication as an ethical issue and potential solution. We hear from patients that many are fearful of coming into the hospital for treatment for fear of contracting COVID. How can providers talk with their patients about this fear and weigh the risk of getting COVID in hospital versus the, uh, the, the risk of delay in treatment uh, that could negatively impact their care? Yeah, so I think maybe more so than ever before, um, COVID has really shown to us the importance of science, uh, public communication, both about science in general and about risk. Um, and risk communication is one of the more complicated concepts uh, in healthcare um, that we can say you have a 62% chance of X happening, um, or, but no individual has 62% of an outcome. They either get it or they don't. Um, and being clear about kind of what that means um, and how to just uh, to parse that apart and to pass that along to patients and families is really challenging. Um, and there are many new kind of risk communication tools, whether it's visual, visual tools or pictograms or other ways of depicting some of these things. And I think that that, that can be helpful. And again, coming back to this idea of expressing the uncertainty, when we say that I know that this is the right thing to do, or I know that you will be safe, or that we have these things in place, that false kind of certainty is, can potentially be really problematic. And though it's intended to give confidence to our patients and families, if we're wrong, and we will sometimes be wrong, that has the potential to have really unintended consequences and really uh, harm that clinician-patient relationship, not only now, but in the future as well. Um, so being clear uh, and understanding when we're providing these discussions, saying, yes, I think it is safe for you to do this, but also being uh, thoughtful about is the way that we typically do this the only way that we can? Can we change our typical processes to minimize risk of infection, but still provide the best cancer-directed care as we can in perhaps altered ways in the setting of the pandemic? Thank you so much, Dr. Marion. So that, that comes to the end of the questions that were entered into the chat. I'd like to thank you for the, uh, those insights. And uh, they're really relevant to what a lot of us are struggling with. And I'm gonna hand back over to, to Jen. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Dr. Marin, for such a thoughtful and relevant talk. You said you'd be asking more questions uh, potentially than giving answers, but uh, I think a large part of this enterprise is actually getting the questions right especially when the issues involve clinical, organizational research, and public health ethics. Uh, and you've really provided some key, I think, ethical guidance in this regard and um, providing an ethics lens around equitable access, just resource allocation, and compassionate communication. And so for this, we're very grateful, and I look forward to bringing these insights back to our, our local and national discussions. Um, I want to say uh, in closing, thank you also to the Harris family and friends for making this lectureship possible and our ability to invite such accomplished speakers such as Dr. Marin. Um, really excellent opportunity and we're very grateful for that. And finally, I also want to thank those of you who've tuned in either real time or if you're watching an archived version of this lecture. Um, but thank you for joining us and uh, we wish you all a good day. Thank you.